Uh, good afternoon. So uh, let's get started. Uh, so welcome to the uh, weekly uh, serious uh, uh, security seminar. Uh, today it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Adam Bates from the University of Illinois uh, at Ber Urbana Champaign. Uh, Adam is an assistant professor in the computer science department at uh, UIUC. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Florida, where he was advised by Professor Kevin Butler uh, in the study of computer systems and cybersecurity. Uh, Adam has conducted research on a variety of security topics, uh, including SSL TLS, cloud computing, USB attack vectors, uh, financial services, and telephony infrastructure. Uh, he's best known for uh, his work in the area of data provenance, uh, particularly the construction of secure provenance-aware systems. Adam? Great. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks so much, Young Young. It's a, a real pleasure to, uh, to be here today. I think that you know, the work that comes out of the Sirius Lab is you know, work that I probably pay attention to just about as much, if not more, than you know, anywhere, any, anywhere else in the country. So it's great to be here to tell you about some of the things that uh, I've been working on. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about some of my uh, recent work in the area of uh, secure data provenance. Uh, and so uh, you know, most of you in the room are probably wondering, uh, you know, what is data provenance? Uh, and, and hopefully I can convince you that it's quite important. Uh, so in 2012, uh, there was this uh, Massachusetts drug testing laboratory. They did a lot of work for court-ordered drug tests. Uh, and they found that two of their lab technicians were, uh, they'd been arrested for tampering with these court-ordered drug tests. So in the aftermath, the lab couldn't even say with certainty uh, which of these test results had been tampered with by these corrupt te technicians, which called into question the authentic authenticity of all of their results, and, and with it, um, over 40,000 drug-related convictions. So in this situation, it was actually a lack of data provenance that led to this disastrous result. Uh, data provenance is metadata that's generated by a computer system uh, that describes the history of the processing tasks it's performed. So we can look at an object's data provenance to determine how that data object came to exist in its present state, which allows us to reason about uh, its value or its, or its integrity. So in this case, uh, the provenance could have been used to identify um, those drug tests that had been tampered with, or perhaps even more importantly, those tests that, that hadn't been tampered with. So uh, we're probably not going to be able to see this uh, very easily um, from where you're standing right here. But you know, here's an example of how we might model one of these uh, provenance, uh, uh, the provenance of these objects in the form of a relation graph. Uh, so what we can see here is that we're starting with um, two samples, uh, lab sample A and lab sample B. Uh, in this next column, we can see that they were both uh, subjected to legitimate data processing uh, results by one of our trustworthy technicians to produce a clean result A and a clean result B. Uh, at this point, though, one of the corrupt technicians actually opened up the, the second result with a text editor in order to generate one of these forged results. So if we had had this data provenance, the case of the, uh, the drug testing facility, we would have been able to say, you know, convictions based on uh, results A uh, are still legitimate, uh, whereas those with results B, they need to be um, you know, brought back into court. Uh, slightly more recent result, uh, or slightly more recent motivation example, um, why on earth did the DNC allow uh, 20,000 uh, of their sensitive emails uh, to leave their corporate network and um, fly out uh, into the ether to some unknown domain in a foreign country, right? Well, you know, the answer to this is complex and kind of spans multiple layers of computer security challenges. But one of them is that, you know, our our network uh, security uh, functions today they don't really have the context necessary uh, in order to examine a network packet and make a highly contextual decision like, you know, where did this packet come from? What data is inside of this packet? Uh, so provenance can provide this type of context, and it's going to play a crucial role in uh, future security mechanisms. Um, data provenance is effectively of use uh, in virtually any scenario where a context-sensitive decision needs to be made about a piece of data. Um, well, we might imagine that, uh, or actually, in fact, uh, provenance is a strategic priority for the Department of Homeland Security and various health industries, uh, for DARPA, uh, and for, for national laboratories. But just having this information isn't enough, right? Um, we also need to be able to secure it. Uh, if, if these lab technicians that were already untrustworthy or uh, these hackers are able to break into these machines, uh, it, it would surely follow that they would also attempt to hide their tracks by tampering with these, uh, these records, right? Uh, so it's important that we have a way of um, establishing trust in the correctness of uh, this data provenance that we're collecting uh, 
Uh, we also need to make sure that uh, these provenance aware mechanisms are, are performant, right? Uh, that they're, uh, they're imposing a minimal overhead on our systems by uh, only collecting the context we need while minimizing the capture of unnecessary information. And so today I wanna to talk to you about uh, two of the systems that I've recently developed that address uh, some key challenges, uh, specifically in the area of efficient and accurate, uh, accurate capture uh, of this data provenance. Um, first, I'm gonna be talking to you about a mechanism that we introduced to uh, dramatically reduce the, the storage costs of collecting this uh, fine-grained audit data um, through the introduction of a, a policy-based uh, compression mechanism. And then subsequently, I'm gonna show you um, even if we're collecting this information a certain layer, like at the operating system, there's, there's important things that are happening at other layers of our architecture uh, that we also need context about. And so we actually need a way to fuse um, provenance that's being captured from different sources. And so I'll show you how we uh, took the example of um, a very complex uh, web service and introduced uh, provenance functions without requiring any modification to the web service itself. Uh, so before we delve into all that, a bit more background. Um, on, on what data provenance is. Uh, as I mentioned, it's metadata that uh, describes the history of an object as it's being processed on the computing system. Um, this history details uh, what's happened to the object uh, from the time it was created, in, including how it came to exist in its present state. Uh, so as I showed you before, we can model provenance as a, a relationship graph, and we have a highly simplistic one here. Uh, there's, there's three uh, principal objects in our graphs. Uh, these vertices uh, are um, entities, which sort of represent various kinds of data objects like files or sockets, uh, activities or, or processes, and then also agents. Um, so what we see here in this graph is that um, this is the provenance of a, a file called output. Uh, it was generated by uh, some process which uh, read into input files, and you know, by the way, it was controlled by a particular user. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, having this information is one thing, but the ability to secure it uh, is, is highly important. Um, given its value, it naturally follows that uh, data provenance is a ripe candidate for a, uh, attack. And so uh, one sort of defining characteristics of my work in this space is that I, I think about uh, collecting this information uh, in the context of an attacker that's gained access to our system is aware that this, uh, you know, this incriminating information is being collected about their activity and is therefore trying to, uh, uh, to, to mess with that, right? Uh, they could uh, dis attempt to disable the mechanism that's recording this data provenance, uh, avoid taking certain actions on the system in order to remain invisible to this mechanism, uh, or they could even attempt to uh, inject uncertainty into our records in, in some way, shape, or form. So I'm not gonna talk about it at length today because I'd like to talk about some newer stuff. Uh, but in prior work, I, I introduced a provenance collection mechanism uh, that can reliably collect this data provenance in, in the presence of such an attacker uh, called Linux provenance modules. And for our purposes today, you know, all we need to understand is that this is an extension to the Linux operating system uh, that establishes a provenance layer. Uh, within uh, within the system so that uh, anytime either something in user space or something in kernel space attempts to perform any task that uh, that, that manipulates a principal kernel object uh, you know virtually anything we can think of like files packets processes uh, fi you know uh, disk partitions so on and so forth uh, we're able to record a record of it and so effectively what this provenance layer does is that it um, just pumps out a stream of information from the kernel uh, which we can think of as like an ultra fine grained audit log. Uh, and then this architecture in user space, it processes it into these uh, really nice uh, relationship graphs that succinctly describe uh, what it is that's happening in the system. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we created this system. Uh, we, we proved that uh, it had certain security properties that uh, prevent it from being tampered with by that attacker. I have backup slides if you want to ask me more questions about that, that's fine. Um, but we also, we evaluated it and we found that we could actually collect this information really quickly, like without messing with the system's performance at all. Uh, in fact, under realistic workloads, we could collect this, uh, this provenance information with just 3% overhead, right? So, you know, al almost negligible, not quite. Uh, then we could also, you know, perform certain tricks to uh, query this information really quickly uh, on the order of milliseconds. So even if I had, you know, these, uh, these massive files of days and days worth of system activity, I could actually represent that in such a way that 
uh, I could very quickly say, well, you know, what's, what's the provenance of, of this particular file and that would output that information. Uh, so that would mean that uh, as, a, as an administrator, I'd be able to quickly figure out what's going on in my system. Now, there was one problem though, uh, and that's something that uh, the Sirius Lab has uh, spent a lot of time thinking about, and it's also one of the core challenges of what I'm gonna be uh, trying to answer today. Uh, if we looked at the, uh, the storage overhead, of, of uh, what this system introduces, it's quite awful, um, right? So uh, this is a, uh, a 10 minute uh, capture uh, using this LPM system uh, using a couple of different backends. So uh, in the, we, let's see, we were compiling a kernel and then recording the provenance of, of that kernel as it was being created. Uh, so in the worst case, if we just took that entire stream of information here and uh, put it in a, a data file, uh, that generated four and a half gigabytes of uh, log information in the course of 10 minutes. Uh, now, now even you know, with our, our naive solutions to the storage problem, it wasn't quite that bad. So um, we uh, were able to, you know, we could store it in a zip file and all that redundancy goes away. Um, the, I, I bragged about the speed with which we could query. You know, that's on the order of uh, you know, maybe 20% uh, storage cost. But this is obviously still a huge problem if we want to start thinking about recording this information for days, weeks, months. Yeah. Does, uh, does your three percent overhead uh, numbers? Yeah. Oh. Press that button. Oh. oh, this is fancy. Does, yeah, uh, it does the uh, does the three percent overhead cost that you uh, quoted include the cost of compressing your data stream? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that that ends up not being a, a, a bottleneck. Okay. Um, it, 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 the, the actual cost of interposing, uh, what we're actually doing is we've got a hook, hook architecture under the hood here that's interposing on all these different call paths in the kernel to um, pop the context, read what's going on, and then sort of uh, pipe this out via a, a relatively efficient uh, Linux kernel relay. Yeah, so that includes the storage cost, but um, you know, if we, let's see, I think I've got it, uh, jot it down. You know, if we imagine that this was the, uh, uh, the amount that we need to store um, over the course of uh, 10 minutes, then uh, let's see, that's uh, 650 gigabytes in a day, that's four and a half terabytes in a week. Uh, so this raw cost of uh, storage threatens to seriously undermine the usefulness of this information. Uh, data provenance is difficult to store and it's difficult to uh, process quickly once it, once it grows up. So uh, we could improve that uh, a bit by using a, a number of different tactics that have been uh, proposed uh, uh, for, uh, coming out of Purdue, you know, we could uh, we could find ways to further compress the log. We could filter events that don't contain any um, useful information, like maybe uh, so, like temporary files would be an example of something that you know no one really cares what happened with that temporary file if it was created by one process and no one else ever read it. So we could cut those things out. Um, but even in the presence of of those techniques, uh, we're still going to um, be logging gigabytes of provenance of day uh, over time. So here's what I find to be the most frustrating thing about that. Um, let's take a look at, you know, what is it that's in these massive provenance logs? Uh, in, in particular with the Linux provenance modules, we're collecting provenance over every single thing that happens in the system uh, from boot time onwards. And so uh, we actually have this massive relationship graph that stems uh, from a single node uh, in the system. Uh, but if we imagine that we're an administrator that's uh, trying to deploy uh, a, a server or a, you know, a container or whatever else for a particular purpose, um, let's say it's a web server. Uh, odds are we're only ever really gonna be interested about the things that actually pertain uh, to, you know, to the intended use of the machine, right? Uh, meanwhile, we've got uh, you know, cron jobs running in the background and you know, other sorts of system noise, uh, the startup process, you know, all the things init did that don't actually inform our Apache web server. Uh, we really only care about you know, uh, our web server, maybe a helper application like HT Access that provides auth for Apache, maybe a database backend, uh, things like that. So optimally, we'd be able to store you know, just the information that we care about, uh, but throw out all of the other information that we need. But we run into a problem here, and um, this has to do with one of those security properties I glossed over when I talked about LPM, and that's you know, the matter of completeness. Uh, when we collect this information, we want to make sure that we have a authoritative record of everything that ever happened with regards to a particular system object. So if we say, well, I only care about the things that Apache does, what happens if Apache does something we don't expect, right? Uh, 
you know, uh, it's a long running program. Eventually, um, it decides to read in an object uh, from somewhere else in the system, right? Maybe this is actually a, um, you know, an unauthorized file access, you know, some bug in Apache. And so it's read a, it's read a file that we didn't expect it to. Unless we were recording the provenance of this particular node the entire time, uh, then we'd be in real trouble here because we no longer have an authoritative, forensically valid description of what it was that Apache was doing on the system. So uh, it ends up being quite difficult to sort of prune out uh, what we think of as uninteresting information because uh, we can't make a definitive statement about what might eventually be interesting uh, later on in the system. So if we're gonna start uh, selectively recording this information in order to save space, uh, we need to have some idea about uh, the future events that are going to happen uh, in order to maintain some assurance of completeness. Uh, so the first you know, fundamental challenge I wanna to talk to you about today is, is just that. Uh, is there a way that we can um, collect a complete, uh, a complete description of one application's activity while safely ignoring uh, that of other system activities? So it, it turns out there is. Uh, we propose that mandatory access control provides exactly an environment in which um, this challenge can be overcome. Uh, in a Mac-enabled system, every object is assigned a security label and uh, there's a policy that dictates the permissible interactions between uh, those different system objects. So if we can figure out a set of system labels uh, that can appear within an application's provenance history, uh, and only request, uh, collect provenance for objects that are assigned that label, we should be able to safely filter out the provenance of uh, any other things that are happening in the system. Uh, so this figure uh, on the screen here provides an intuition of, uh, you know, of what it is that we're proposing here. Uh, as I showed you uh, down here, we've got you know, another sample provenance graph that shows some relationships between different objects in the system. But we can also take a security policy and model it as an information flow graph. Uh, so as provenance is a history of what happens in a system, an information flow graph can be thought of as like a, a future of permissible actions on the system. And we can actually uh, overlay the information flow graph onto the history of events in order to make informed decisions about what it is uh, that we need to collect on the system. So, you know, in other words, we're going to analyze the relationships that exist uh, within the information flow plane in order to uh, filter out the activity of uh, what are effectively unreachable objects uh, in the provenance plane. So uh, using the uh, Linux provenance modules framework, uh, unsurprisingly it's modular, right? Uh, we, we implemented a mechanism that enables this functionality that we call uh, provenance walls. Yeah? Just a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, for, the, uh, for the provenance wall, do you actually assume, uh, yes. here we go. Uh, do, you ha do you assume that the system uh, has not been uh, compromised? Because uh, if I understand correctly, if uh, the system has been compromised, then uh, some of the MAC policy enforcement may not be uh, working properly. And then uh, you start to see kind of information flow going rampant or going out of their regular pattern. Right. Uh, yeah. But that's exactly the moment when we need uh, provenance. Of course, yeah. yeah. So, so, so the question was, um, uh, effectively, are we trusting the kernel? Exactly. And if so, why is or, that reasonable? Exactly. Or, right. or, or any, yeah. Right. any of the processes uh, that are running uh, right. that so, might so, have been compromised. So I would argue that you know, probably one of the... Uh, one of the primary reasons uh, for uh, enabling mandatory access control is to assure kernel integrity, exactly. right? Yeah. Um, so by no means, so right. It's a chicken you know, and the, egg kind of a situation. Yeah, I guess so. So mm -hmm. the, uh, um, yeah, the, the issue of providing a 100% correct security policy is somewhat orthogonal to the work. Yeah. Um, but you know, what, what does mandatory access control buy us normally? Yeah. Um, well, it uh, hopefully buys us uh, uh, kernel integrity, right? Certainly, like a full-featured uh, Linux security module like SE Linux, you know, has a has a default policy that um, is somewhat permissive in user space, but um, is supposed to harden uh, anything related to uh, interactions with kernel subjects and kernel objects. Okay. Uh, and then, in addition, uh, additionally, in SE Linux, uh, applications can define their own policies to permit uh, what's supposed to be happening on the system, uh, creating these subdomains of system activity. So. Uh, there, there's sort of two concerns that, that Mac is trying to solve for us, uh, both, of, both of which are least privileged uh, in the end. So uh, we certainly want to make sure that our kernel isn't compromised, uh, and if, it, it is indeed game over if that's the case. But another thing that we want, uh, want, our, want our mandatory access control to enable is uh, least privilege in user space. You know, if Apache is compromised, uh, 
Uh, it should only be able to uh, do things that Apache is supposed to do. Um, it shouldn't be able to interact with the rest of the system. Uh, now, if something really important like Apache is compromised, there's all sorts of bad things that can happen within you know, the, uh, the confined space that Apache's permitted. So we still care about the provenance of that uh, mechanism. Um, uh, but so I guess that's a long answer to your question. Yeah. Uh, you know, in, in short, yeah, we're, we're um, assuming that uh, the kernel's correct at the time of installation. Uh, we do want to account for attacks on kernel integrity, but you know, our, uh, leveraging on past work is you know, effectively how we do that. Right, so um, here's, here's another look at uh, what LPM kind of looks like under the hood. Um, we have effectively a second reference monitor on the system uh, where uh, things are happening in user space. Uh, if the security mechanisms in the kernel allow it, then we're going to record provenance for that operation before it occurs and, and store it. Uh, so what provenance walls does, it sort of adds, uh, you know, what I'm gonna slightly inappropriately call a training phase because there's no machine learning here. Um, but so we have a policy generator for, for data provenance that takes as input the security policy of the system, Oops, sorry screen, uh, and then also a minimal amount of administrator preference, uh, something like, you know, what application is it that I care about on the system? So given the security policy and the administrator's preferences, we generate a provenance policy that's loaded into the kernel, and at that point, uh, whenever a new event occurs, the provenance monitor is going to uh, pop the security contexts of the objects involved in that event, decide whether or not they match the, pro the provenance policy, and uh, if and only if that is the case, will we generate a new event? Otherwise, the provenance monitor uh, takes no action. Uh, all right, so uh, that's, the, that's the goal of the system. Um, now we need to figure out, like, how, how do we actually you know, do this? What, what is formally the goal that we're trying to provide when we say, um, I want to collect everything I need and, and nothing that I don't? Um, so uh, for that, we're going to need to uh, in introduce a little bit of uh, notation and define a, a couple of um, you know, formal, formal properties. So let's see, what have we got here? Um, let's say E is the set of all event tuples that, that happen in the system. Uh, G is a provenance graph that uh, describes the uh, execution of E. Uh, now I is a subset of E, and those are the things that the administrator actually cares about. So we might imagine you know, all of the event tuples that inform Apache. Uh, and then finally, we have a, a provenance function P, which is effectively a query. Uh, it returns all of the events in G uh, that pertain to the history of a particular object. So before our goal was, uh, was completeness. Um, for every object X that we can find in our uh, set of tu event tuples, we need to return uh, all of the other events that pertain to that particular object. Uh, we can begin to relax that. Uh, by saying, okay, if you're an object X that appears in the set of events that I actually care about, uh, then we need to return everything, uh, undefined, undefined behavior if you're not in the set I. Uh, and then uh, what we're striving for with provenance walls, uh, if you are in the set of interesting things, return everything. If you are not in the set of interesting things, uh, then, then return nothing. All right, so uh, given that definition, we now need a means of uh, partitioning the set of MAC labels so that uh, for a particular target application S, uh, the policy satisfies this property of minimal completeness. So uh, as I pointed to, our solution involves uh, analyzing the system security policy in order to identify a set of security labels that constitute uh, target application's trusted computing base, or, or TCB. So the TCB can be thought of as the set of objects upon which a given application depends. And intuitively, if we collect provenance for every single object that's within an application's trusted computing base, we should have a complete description of, of that particular application's uh, history. All right, so here's our solution for that. Uh, we need to, uh, th this is our, our solution for, uh, for calculating this trusted computing base. Um, first, we have a security policy and all of the associate mandatory access control labels, uh, which we'll call L. We have a target subject S. So first we identify um, all of the subjects on the system that can write to the kernel. Uh, again, if you can write to my operating system, I necessarily need to trust you. So all of our kernel writers are included in um, our list of <coughs> trusted subjects. Uh, we also have um, all of the subjects in the system that can write to my target applications executable. Again, if you can overwrite my application binary, uh, then I necessarily need to uh, include you in my trusted computing base. And then finally, we have 
um, T sub H, which is the set of uh, subjects that can write to my helper applications. Uh, so you'll recall I used in my example Apache. Um, Apache, Apache actually identifies additional applications and subjects within its policy, such as HT access, which says, you know, this is a different entity, uh, but I depend on it. And so we need to identify um, all of the subjects that can write to those helper applications. What is the granularity of subjects? Are they uh, processes or threats? Or it could be something even smaller? Uh, so a, a, what is the granularity yeah. of subjects? Um, so they are mapped to processes, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Um, or can, they, can they be mapped to individual threads? I th I'm not sure. Okay. I'd have to go, but, <laughs> I'd have to yeah. go look at the, uh, the process control block and remember. So yeah, but we're, we're in the order of uh, processes, processes and threads. Basically, uh, a user will be associated with a particular security exactly. context and when that user invokes something, the, uh, the, the subject label is passed on to the application. So it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. A process mm -hmm. could run with different you know, security labels at different times, obviously. Yeah. Um, so, so these three groups of <coughs> writers combined form our set of trusted subjects. So to identify all the objects on the system that we trust, uh, we go through, we take the set of untrusted subjects on the system, and we say, if none of the untrusted subjects can write to you, then you're a trusted object. And so that gives us uh, a trusted computing base, which is the union of all the trusted subjects in the system and all the trusted objects in the system. And despite this complexity, um, you know, I did mention a human earlier, this is actually the only thing that we need from the administrator. Mm. Uh, if you can tell us uh, the application that you care about, AKA the subject uh, that you care about, uh, then we can identify procedurally um, the entire trusted computing base of, of that particular app application by mining the policy. Uh, so. Uh, we, we took this system and uh, we deployed it against a variety of um, applications in order to figure out uh, what was going on. Uh, we first considered uh, three different sort of forensic investigation scenarios uh, where an attack has occurred and an investigator wishes to attribute that attack to a certain agent in the system. Uh, so for each of these uh, cases, a web server, an FTP server, and a, a database management server, uh, we went on to exploitdb.com and found um, a uh, a working exploit for that attack, uh, as well as the uh, SE Linux security policy associated with um, each of these applications. And then we turned that exploit into uh, a workload by interspersing it with uh, hundreds uh, to thousands of legitimate requests. We also considered a fundamentally different scenario, which we thought might be pretty cool, um, relating to that of uh, managing and monitoring a cloud computing infrastructure. Uh, so here an administrator might wish to sort of monitor the configuration of their host machines uh, without capturing all of the activity that was being generated by the guests in the system running within VMs. Um, since VMs are isolated from the host through virtualization, uh, we were able to take the uh, KMU KVM policy uh, and uh, minimally modify it in order to create a um, provenance policy that uh, represents the scenario. And then within the VM, we ran a um, a postmark benchmark in order to identify what was going on. All right, so uh, here are our results. Um, and so what we're effectively seeing in each of these domains is it's kind of a mixed bag. Uh, in all of the forensic scenarios, the amount with which we were able to reduce the size of these logs varied um, from 32% uh, to almost 60%. Um, in the case of the cloud provider, though, we were able to reduce the size of the provenance log by 90%. Um, effectively, what this says is that uh, we have a, first of all, we have a highly sort of domain specific mechanism for savings. Um, it, your use case is going to depend on whether or not this is going to be a good tool for you to use. Uh, in the cases of the forensics investigations, uh, the web server, the FTP server, and the SQL server, that was what we cared about. So it's not surprising that we weren't able to get dramatic reduction because we said, uh, pay attention to these things. And so, you know, the background noise in the system was the only thing we were able to filter out. And in some cases, that was only a, a minority of what was taking place. Uh, in the case of the cloud provider, we actually identified a scenario in which uh, the thing we cared about was actually generating a minimal footprint on the system. And so we were able to uh, see a lot of savings as a result of uh, deploying this uh, policy reduction technique. So um, I'll mention it again here before you have to leave. Uh, you know, the, the cool thing about this is that uh, this, is, uh, this can be uh, easily composed with any of the other 
uh, methods for reducing provenance costs that we've seen. You know, we're, we're not making, uh, we're not leveraging any knowledge about common uh, data processing paradigms like something like LogGC would. Uh, we're not uh, we're not leveraging uh, information about the internal semantics of a program like execution partitioning does, right? Um, so uh, you know the good news is while this isn't the total this isn't the total solution to our problems, um, it plays very nicely with some of the other things that are appearing in the literature now. Um, cool. So now I'm going to pivot and talk about uh, the the second uh, piece of work. If you'd like to uh, step out now, I see it's uh, about five o'clock. Okay. Okay. Great. Good. Um, so, uh, you know, I've talked about uh, using web applications as a motivating scenario um, throughout this talk thus far, um, but there's, there's actually another uh, pretty significant problem uh, if we're trying to capture the provenance of a web server. Uh, so what we have here is kind of a, a dummy workflow uh, for a web application. Um, we've got uh, lots of clients connecting. Um, the web server has some number of worker threads that are happening. We've got J workers here. Um, but then uh, this is, you know, a stateful web service, so it's actually performing a lot of communication to a database backend as well. Uh, so, you know, let's let's think about what the provenance of an individual web request might look like. You know, I'm client I, um, I send a request to, you know, Facebook.com or what have you. Uh, Facebook uh, processes the requests, uh, queries some data store, and sends me back some results. So we might expect that. Um, our, uh, our provenance would look something like this, right? Um, the, the web application received my response. It uh, used some information that was provided by the database. And then, oh, I'm sorry, it received my response. It used some information that was provided by the database. And then it sent me back a web response, right? Um, so there's a problem here. And it, it has to do with a uh, semantic gap uh, that exists between the operating system and user space. Uh, this is actually what the provenance would look like. Um, because we have a whole lot of different clients connecting to uh, this particular web server, client I, uh, is, if we don't understand what's happening under the hood in this web service, we end up in a scenario where we have to conservatively assume that uh, this response, the response to client I, is actually dependent on all of the other work that the web server did previously. Um, so this, uh, this, this general problem uh, it's delightfully called a dependency explosion, uh, right? So uh, we've got all of these different, um, all of these different uh, relationships that exist in the provenance of this particular uh, web web app. It's not actually true. This is a this is a false dependency, and also it uh, it, it makes these uh, results almost uh, completely unusable. And so that was a toy scenario, right? Um, this problem only gets worse as our our applications get uh, more and more complex. So you know what we have here is a um, AWS based or an EC2 based um, web app service, and we can see, or perhaps we can't see that uh, you know within this figure we have uh, load balancers and uh, application servers. We have a number of different database backends, and we also have a test environment that uh, the the, uh, ser the the users of the the developers of the service are using. Um, and so you know as we think about this dependency explosion problem. Uh, if we if we took this workflow and sent it through a realistic work application, we would just have a completely unusable record of that of that individual web request that would basically span the history of everything that's happened in the system. Um, so so this semantic gap problem uh, is real. Uh, it leads to false provenance and uh, it, it very much threatens to undermine the usefulness of these things that we're doing within the operating system. Um, so there, there's a lot of different solutions to this problem, and some of them have been uh, proposed by Dong Yong and, uh, and the, the group here at, at Sirius, um, we could instrument the application to make it provenance aware, uh, would be one, one straightforward thing to do, right? Um, uh, so for example, in the case of Apache, we could uh, let us t ask Apache to let us know every single time it's starting to field a new request. And that would allow us to decompose those individual web requests into autonomous units of work. Right, so that so that's something that's come out of here, you know, using uh, program analysis and transformation, and, and it's really great. Um, but uh, you know, especially when we think about this environment, you know, we don't have the source code for all of these different uh, web components, right? Um, this is all owned by different developers. Uh, they might not be particularly interested in helping us get this fine-grained audit information that we want to. Uh, it might violate some license somewhere for us to uh, instrument the code uh, in a certain way. Uh, so, 
uh, wh while those approaches are promising, we wanted to adopt a slightly different usage model uh, where we assumed that we didn't have any uh, developer cooperation, we didn't have access to source code, and we didn't want to instrument any applications. Uh, so we basically wanted uh, our web service to work uh, exactly as it used to uh, without, um, uh, without us having to intercede on anything uh, in practice. So, so this leads us to uh, our, our second uh, challenge of the day that I want to tackle with you. Uh, is it possible to observe uh, these application-specific workflows without actually needing to uh, modify the application? So thinking back to this sort of cloud-based scenario, we thought um, people uh, layer on security solutions to um, networks all the time, right? You know, that's, that's what our, our firewalls are and our IDS and all these different sort of security-oriented middle boxes. Um, can we take this, this, uh, this similar concept of network function virtualization and then apply that to the, the auditing problem as well in order to um, piece together this? And so that's exactly what we did. Um, we, we proposed that uh, let's introduce some network provenance functions to go alongside our security functions. Uh, and what these uh, NPFs do, you know, the, the core insight is that uh, an operating system under the hood, you know, it can't easily make sense of the internal state of an application. Um, but it is relatively easy to uh, interpose on uh, communications between different components in a system through you know, different kinds of IPC or network uh, proxies. And since uh, so many of these uh, protocols that are, are being used to communicate between components is uh, moving, in, uh, moving in the direction of standardization. You know, we've got all these ubiquitous uh, protocols like HTTP and, and SQL and uh, different types of message passing protocols. It'd actually be pretty straightforward to uh, parse those in order to extract the, the ways in which different components are communicating with each other. And so if we're able to understand what the communications are, we can then generate a provenance that describes the interactions between components. So in order to enable this, uh, we're gonna uh, introduce uh, uh, this uh, box here, oranges. Orange is the things that we've messed with. So um, we have our LPM provenance modules in the operating system. Uh, but between components so that we don't have to uh, manipulate the actual application or the actual database, we're going to implement an explicit forward proxy that uh, basically um, interposes on the traffic, it parses the communication, and then it generates provenance. And we can spread these proxies all over uh, our web service and have all of that information aggregated into uh, an individual provenance data store. Um, so what we did was uh, we performed a little bit of minimal modification uh, to the web server, but not the application, in order to facilitate uh, execution partitioning. Uh, and then for the rest, we applied these proxies to uh, interpose on components in order to figure out um, the ways that they're communicating with one another. So here's an here's a, uh, example of how this, uh, how this workflow might be modified. Uh, just like before, we have an incoming web request that reaches our web server. Um, a, single line of code inside of our web server before the application code is reached notifies our uh, provenance record that a new unit of work has started. Uh, the application uh, you know, parses the request and then uh, sends a request out to the database, which is intercepted by a database capture agent uh, that in turn um, generates more provenance and sends that into our provenance store. Uh, it checks the return values of the database and then uh, when we reach the web server again, we notify our provenance store that this particular unit of work has ended. So now we've been able to uh, partition the execution of the server, and moreover, we're able to uh, connect, uh, provide linkability between uh, the different application components in our system. All right, so uh, just a couple examples of uh, what, these, uh, uh, what these network provenance functions actually do. So let's take a look at, you know, how would we parse uh, a SQL request in order to turn it into a provenance record. Uh, so here, let's see, we have a select statement where we uh, look at the employee ID, um, the first name and last name of the employee, uh, the table where this information is coming from, and then we uh, filter our results based on uh, their salary. So uh, we take the SQL query and then uh, use a bison grammar to turn it into a parse tree, right? Um, and it's uh, very easy to see that all of the different uh, data entities exist in the leaves of this parse tree here. So uh, 
our take on this is that obviously we want to have a record of the explicit data accesses that are happening, you know, like the values that are being returned. Um, so uh, we're going to definitely create a record that um, the employee's ID field of the employee's table was accessed, that the first and last names field of the employee's table was accessed. Um, but then also we have this uh, filter function here. So even though we're not returning the salary, we're clearly leaking information about the contents of the salary field, right? So our solution to this was to extend the provenance grammar uh, to uh, refer to these as implicit data accesses. Uh, and then in the case of ephemeral uh, constants and things like that, we don't record it at all because uh, we assume that that doesn't really contain any meaningful information. Uh, so, so based on this sort of uh, labeling, uh, we can then create a provenance graph that says, uh, all right, this select statement uh, made use of uh, these three fields. It made implicit use of this particular field. And then uh, all of these uh, tables were a member of, uh, all, all of these fields were a member of the employees table. Um, and so, you know, we can take that intuition and apply it to a number of different protocols, uh, basically any form of structured data we can apply these tricks to, right? Uh, so, you know, in the case of um, uh, some SOAP uh, encoded uh, remote procedure calls, uh, again, we can sort of uh, look at the, the body of the uh, SOAP envelope in order to infer uh, what sorts of relationships exist within this particular request. All right, so we went ahead and implemented this system. Um, this was a bit of a more complex deployment. Uh, for the different applications, we were continuing to collect information uh, within the operating system, so LPM is still out here. Um, we deploy these uh, net, uh, this virtualized uh, provenance collection functions. Um, as I mentioned, we made a small modification to the Apache web server since we didn't have Dongyang source code. Uh, uh, rather than uh, use his automated tool, we just added a couple lines of code, and by a couple I mean less than five. Uh, so that's how straightforward it was to buy us the execution partitioning step. Uh, and then we have uh, this uh, provenance recorder that maintains an in-memory graph of uh, the provenance of these different objects. All right, uh, so we tested uh, the overhead of this system against a bunch of different um, realistic web service workloads. Uh, we used uh, sort of the iconic Dell DVD store benchmark, uh, Ruby's, uh, and uh, Wikibench, which is you know, what, uh, the, what Wikimedia or WikiLeaks is based off of. And so in spite of the fact that we're performing this um, pretty invasive uh, interposition on uh, these intercomponent communications, it turns out we're still able to impose a relatively modest overhead on these uh, different web services, um, just 11% end-to-end -end overhead on, the, on these uh, realistic workloads. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's an argument to be made that we can use these network provenance functions in order to compose uh, a sort of complete holistic view of what's happening in these complex systems where we don't have access to the code. Uh, so what does that exactly buy us? Uh, well, one, as I mentioned, uh, if we think about uh, a SQL injection attack, uh, there, there's actually a couple of different things happening here, right? So a successful SQL injection attack, um, by, you know, a packet is received by a web server, um, some sort of malcrafted input successfully uh, bypasses uh, the sanitation logic of the web application, and then it reaches uh, the backend database uh, in, you know, where a SQL request has you know, been reformed in the clear. Uh, so web server, web application, database. We actually need to understand the provenance of all these different uh, entities in order to explain the attack succinctly. And so this is what uh, the uh, network uh, provenance functions buy us. We can uh, identify that a particular uh, HTTPD worker was associated with a particular network input at a given moment. And then using the uh, proxies, we're able to uh, link that to the contents of the SQL request. So we can see here that, um, well, HTTPD worker uh, read in a, a request from a particular remote host. And uh, in the end, uh, it accessed uh, some information about our credit cards, right? So uh, it would be relatively easy, thinking back to the DNC example, uh, to make a rule such as, um, I don't know much about uh, the, my system, but I know that you know, uh, PCI data should only be uh, flowing to the Visa network. And therefore, if this goes to any IP address that's not associated with the Visa network, I know something's up, right? Uh, so we can use this to sort of perform uh, data loss prevention within the system. Uh, yet another example. Anybody, uh, anyone remember what Image Tragic was? It was a pretty big, a pretty big deal. So uh, Image Magic is this uh, ludicrously pervasive uh, 
uh, image processing uh, library. Uh, that's uh, you know basically the back end of everything that happens on Linux in terms of uh, manipulating <coughs> files or or posting files. So it's uh, it's common in a lot of different web services, uh, and you know in spite of the fact that it's been around for decades, uh, someone figured out that if you send it a malcrafted input uh, that looks like this, um, I think this is a, P a PNG file or something like that, it, you can basically perform arbitrary code execution. Uh, so I think this was a hot thing in like 2014. It's, it's a little dated, but it's still relevant. Um, and so uh, again, you know, the problem here is that uh, we, we're dealing with some application specific semantics like uh, image magic. We're also dealing with the aftermath where someone's able to drop the shell, install a reverse shell on the machine and do all these system commands. And so using uh, this um, network provenance virtualization thing in tandem with uh, operating system monitoring, we can reconstruct this uh, very succinct explanation of, um, of, of what happened within this uh, cross-layer attack. Uh, we see uh, an HTTP request that was used by uh, one particular Apache worker. Um, this is the uh, normal operation of libmagic, uh, or sorry, uh, image magic rather. And then uh, when we uh, upload uh, rsh.jpg, all of a sudden we drop the shell and we do a bunch of nasty stuff. Uh, so again, we could make a pretty simple rule about you know, uh, how, how Apache is allowed to use the exec or the system, uh, system call, right? And then you know, if we see that, um, oh, it's using curl or it's using uh, bash, I don't think it should be doing that, we can sort of procedurally stop these attacks in their tracks. All right, um, so how am I doing on time? Three minutes, five minutes, all right. Uh, wrapping up, uh, hopefully I've shown you today that uh, provenance collection uh, is a good idea, right? Um, it, it allows us uh, transparency into the nature of these various system intrusions. And especially as we abandon the idea of perfect security and move into this world where, you know, eventually a powerful attacker will get in no matter what, um, it becomes really important for us to understand what's happening in a system at any given moment. Um, so hopefully I've shown you that uh, not only is data provenance important, but also that we can perform various tricks to scope uh, our, col our, our, um, our data collection by leveraging uh, foreknowledge about how the system is going to be used, uh, and also that we can uh, sort of compose data provenance that's being collected all of these different sources in order to solve higher level problems. Uh, what's next for me? Uh, I think there's all sorts of domains where uh, this uh, functionality is desperately needed, and so I'm, I'm looking into some more domain-specific challenges there. Uh, containers are a thing. Uh, they're very important. Uh, oddly enough, the security community doesn't seem to be all that interested in them because they're basically over-glorified to root, right? Uh, it's, you know, the isolation is not impressive, uh, but the, uh, the fact that uh, people are using them regardless of what the security community thinks, uh, that's a reason to take note. Um, so, you know, we have these massive uh, container clusters now that people are using, you know, to de design these very same web services. Uh, how can we create provenance-based solutions to scale, the, to meet the demand of, of security concerns in these kinds of data centers? You know, what if, uh, what if the manager of my Docker Swarm uh, wants to have a succinct explanation in the form of data provenance of literally everything that's happening in the data center at once? Uh, clearly, there's more work to be done here. There's also a few opportunities. Um, likewise, uh, in the Internet of Things, we've got sort of unique problems. We've got this uh, heterogeneous computing environment where, again, we've got all these proprietary closed source systems. I can't jump in and replace the kernel um, for my light bulb or something like that, right? Um, you know, surely, you know, a couple of uh, dedicated grad students could do it in the lab, but, you know, what, what meaning is that going to have? Like, no one's going to use, uh, you know, my Providence Aware light bulb, right? Uh, so the, the challenge then becomes uh, how, do we, uh, how do we record this type of information in a system where uh, everything's closed source, um, nothing's running on the same platform, and by the way, we might have you know, four or five different uh, radio interfaces in a single device, you know, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, Z-Wave, so on and so forth. There's, there's all these different channels that could be used for attackers uh, in such a system. And then moreover, since we're cyber-physical, um, you know, how do we incorporate notions of locality into all of this? You know, I might have an attacker with physical access to my home uh, that's driving through the neighborhood or that's, you know, attacking over the Internet uh, through, through traditional means. So uh, there is, there's a lot of, uh, you know, exciting things to tackle in this area of making transparent systems. Uh, with that, um, 
You know, this work wouldn't be possible without uh, uh, my student Waji at the University of Illinois, um, some of my collaborators from uh, Penn State and Lincoln, and um, my advisor Kevin Butler and colleagues at the University of Florida. Um, much of the code that I discussed today is available online at linuxprovenance.org. Uh, so, you know, if you've got some uh, course project coming up in the fall and you'd like to mess with this, uh, feel free. Uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Um, I'm always going to forget that. Uh, the uh, this providence, uh, the, or this data providence mm -hmm. is uh, is stored locally on the uh, the the uh, providence uh, like dispatcher, um, yeah. right? Either that's in the, like the local computer, or in the case of the cloud uh, cloud environment, you have a separate machine, mm -hmm. right? Um, is uh, an attacker an attacker could uh, like if they're if they're given access if they're allowed to uh, uh, execute uh, arbitrary uh, arbitrary commands, right? Uh, they could the, the attacker could erase uh, this providence information. Is right. that true? Uh, yeah. So you know, there's well, there's a couple things. Um, <clears throat> part of this has to do with the fact that I didn't want to spend an entire day talking about LPM, and so I apologize <laughs> for that. I was okay. like, it's secure. Trust me. Um, so so yeah, we think about in a single host environment uh, what we need in order to do that. Um, the good news is, uh, so first of all, we are assuming that mandatory access controls like SE Linux are enabled. Uh, in order to ensure that you know nothing in user space except for the actual trusted computing base of LPM uh, can interact with our components in user space like our, our data store or this daemon that's you know receiving things from the kernel uh, it's such a simple workflow that it's very easy to protect right so it's like a 10 line SE Linux policy that says uh, you know nothing else in user space can mess with this so since it's not network facing uh, we have a pretty reasonable uh, although not a verifiable guarantee that uh, we should expect these things to uh, operate unperturbed. Uh, in, in this case, where we're introducing these network-facing uh, middle boxes, uh, things are a little dicier, and we, we don't fully have an account for that. Um, you know, the, the closest hand-wavy argument I could provide to you is that these things are, um, I think this one's on the order of a couple thousand lines of code, and this one's on the order of like 500 lines of code. So uh, there's, not, there's not too much room for, uh, you know, we, we could conceivably um, sort of formally verify these, although I have no intention of doing so. Right? Um, so, you know, we, we, could, we could take a look at this and uh, make it, uh, uh, we well, could harden this pretty effectively. The, the, the attacker could, uh, could modify, uh, it could modify the stuff. So uh, to throw, you know, peop, the forensics, uh, the forensics off the trail of, like they could, they, it sounds like, it sounds like potentially, um, you know, if, if someone just you know wipes out your 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 database uh, that you're storing all the stuff and that's pretty obvious but someone could perhaps modify uh, modify the existing uh, providence information so that it hides the fact that the stuff was modified right or whatnot, yeah that, right? that's I mean that's a that's a huge right. concern right. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to account for with these different security guarantees um, so we have an answer for that in the single host environment. Um, effectively, the only way for you to manipulate the log is to actually perform an action. Uh, so it's not really a manipulation. There's not a way for them to you know, claim they did something that they didn't um, because of the way that we're uh, interposing on um, kernel operations. Mm -hmm. uh, the only way that something winds up in the log is if it actually occurred. Um, so if you inject a bunch of noise to make it confusing as to what your intent was, like you know, we, yeah, we need to account for that, but also uh, we would still have an accurate description of what it was that you were doing. Similarly here, um, we're, we're assuming that we've enforced some sort of, um, some network flow rules such that the database can't be by, the, the, uh, the middle box can't be bypassed in order to reach the database, right? Uh, so that we should have an accurate uh, description of the events that happened. Would, uh, would cryptographic signatures of the, uh of the Providence data, would that, uh, uh, would that help? So, so that's that, something else that we've looked at. Um, so in particular, if we, you know, if we're, we're not relying on this core root of trust, which is the operating system, and there's arguments for you not wanting to do that, uh, 
Uh, we might want, you know, if we're in an environment where we have a, a network data center and we assume that anything's uh, subject to Byzantine faults, uh, some, uh, some of my collaborators have shown that uh, you can actually get some pretty good guarantees through using a message commitment protocol which signs up on every packet. And uh, as long as there was uh, at least one remaining good node in the system that saw what the bad node did, uh, then you can still figure out uh, that you know something bad's gone on in your network. Yeah. So yeah, that's something else that uh, that's that's happening in the field. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Great. Uh, thanks for your time, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure speaking with you.